Well, a very warm welcome to everyone to the latest edition of Powering Up the North. This year, we will focus on how we can level up the Northwest while keeping costs down. Um, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Polly Billington from UK 100, and I'll explain a little bit about what UK 100 does in a moment. But I think we can all agree that we're living in very difficult times when it comes to energy. With global gas prices soaring, consumers and businesses are being hit with unprecedented rises in energy prices, alongside inflation. And this crisis comes in the context of long-term commitments to reach net zero through smart and targeted investment, which should have widespread benefits, but achieving it always has challenges and perhaps never more so than now. So this session will explore how Electricity Northwest can lead the way to net zero at lowest cost while delivering best value for customers and consumers. Um, UK 100 has, uh, has done a lot of work on this area and we work closely with distri distribution network operators like um, Electricity Northwest. The reality is the transition to net zero involves huge changes to the energy we use, how we generate it, how it is distributed, and of course, how resilient that network is. Understanding how that system looks and how it functions needs transforming away from big, nationally significant projects to factor in the contribution place-based developments can make to net zero delivery. And different perspectives need to be fed in and for place-based deliver delivery, local authorities are key. That's why our network of, of uh, local government members, uh, local government leaders are so, is so important to engage with the energy sector to design that energy um, uh, system of the future. Um, they can help engage citizens, they understand the lie of their patch, they have a legal role in planning, but also they add value because they have an integrated approach to solutions, which no other actor can replicate from the bins to the lights, to planning, local authorities have the key to thinking about a place in its, in its um, uh, totality, rather than just in different sections. So we work to facilitate that engagement between locally elected leaders and DNOs, and we know that they recognize the need to better understand each other's roles and responsibilities and build some ways of working that add value to each. So I'm really keen, I'm really pleased that Electricity Northwest has been involved and eager to collaborate in that work. I'll share with you a little bit about that later on. But in, uh, what we need to think about is how investing in the transition from fossil fuels offers a massive opportunity to rebuild our economy post COVID, as well as acknowledging those challenges. The solutions won't be the same everywhere. Here on the panel today, we have people from the Cumbrian, uh, the Cumbrian Energy Coast through to Cheshire, so even within one region, and as you know, sometimes in London, everyone thinks, uh, Londoners can think that the whole of the Northwest is the same. You guys don't, you, you guys know that it's different and that the energy solutions will be different. And again, those local leaders will be important. Um, we also need to know how to unlock the capital that's required. We've identified the potential to unlock 100 billion pounds worth of investment in local energy systems by 2030 through partnership approaches. But that requires changes to the rules. It requires business. It requires the UK Infrastructure Bank to think about providing patient capital um, and so forth. And it means that uh, we will therefore be able to. Uh, uh, therefore, we will be able to invest in the kind of uh, uh, of systems that are required. But that requires government support to be able to do it, and uh, and also off gem really has a, an important role to play. So that's why I'm so pleased we're going to hear from. Um, uh, Jonathan Brearley, this, uh, the chief executive of Ofgem, uh, uh, encouraging DNOs to think about using local area energy plans and planning as part of the development of their business plans. But as yet, that isn't yet currently mandated. We think that probably needs to be the case. We'd like to see guidance and strategic direction from Ofgem and national government and future systems operator, the industry and public sector bodies collaborating and integrating plans regional coordination and a defined mandatory role for local area energy plans. Now, I think that's a lot of things that we'll be talking about today in relation to what you're already doing, but also what needs to change in order to be able for the people on this call to be able to do so much more. I look forward to the discussion today. I think it's going to be really exciting. We've got some fantastic speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to uh, to um, uh, uh, Peter Emery, but I think before I do that, am I supposed to do some housekeeping? I forgot to do housekeeping before I start. I know we all know the Zoom rules, um, so I'd just like to um, remind everybody of, uh, of what they are. 
Um, it's going to be recorded. It'll be shared online. Um, if you have, if you are hard of hearing or you've got other things on, I know sometimes my cat can get in the way. Live captions are available and can be enabled or disabled. Please use the hashtag if you're going public on social media, hashtag PUN22 and tag in Electricity News and Devo Connect to join the debate. Share your questions and comments using the chat and during the Q&A, use the raise your hand function because then I, I, myself and the Devo Connect team will be able to stop you and be able to bring you into the conversation. This needs to be as dynamic as possible. There is a lot of expertise on this call and we want to be able to hear from it. And speakers, of course, please don't forget to mute your microphones when not in use, remembering to unmute when engaging in the debate and use the raise your hand function to respond to a question. So I hope that's all OK and we're all ready uh, to go ahead. Please, I'd love to uh, introduce now Peter Emery, the Chief Executive of Electricity Northwest, for our opening address. Thank you, Polly. And I'd like to add my welcome to you all uh, to this Powering Up the North event, uh, first event of 2022. Um, as Polly alluded to at the beginning, I mean, there are, as we sit here today, there are so many challenges and events facing and impacting on our sector, that this event could last a week, not, not just two hours. Um, we also know it's a very difficult time for customers, businesses, local authorities and other stakeholders. Um, and we're, we're reminded of that on a, on a regular basis in our day-to-day -day ac activities. You'll be relieved to hear I'm gonna focus really on our ED2 business plan and touch upon the impact of the recent storms, which I think warrants some discussion because I think they've provided a very clear and visible test um, uh, really to the UK's plans to move to a low carbon economy. So what can we learn from them? So let me just talk a little bit about ENWL uh, to, to, to position uh, the discussion on, on the business plan. We're a relatively small DNO, but we turn this potential weakness into a strength by being agile, innovative and sector leading in critical areas. Um, we believe that by driving performance, uh, we deliver benefit for all our customers, and not just in the Northwest, actually, but across the UK, because if we can push the envelope and push performance benchmarks, then other DNOs will, will, will respond to it. So that is, that is really our, our USP. Um, we've also got the highest proportion of fuel poverty of any of the DNOs, so therefore cost is critical to us. Um, and from our perspective, we should not let costs be a constraint to providing value for money, but it is critical. And I'll come back to this theme later. So what we're trying to do is to seek sector leading performance with sector leading costs for the benefit of all. So our, what we're trying to do here is provide best possible value. My experience business in general is these, these two uh, potentially conflicting objectives uh, are not always in conflict. You can get often sector leading performance with sector leading costs, because it's about how you run your business. So let's move on to our, our business plan. Um, as many of you on this call know, um, we consulted very widely and thoroughly over the last two years to develop our business plan and ensure that it meets the ambitions and needs of the Northwest, um, many of which uh, involve accelerated uh, net zero targets across the entire region. Um, we've used triangulation um, to get our priorities right, and we've also tested them with social return on investment. We've worked very closely with local authorities and stakeholders. Uh, we pioneered the use of decarbonisation pathways in the UK, uh, working with GMCA uh, and Cumbria and, and Lanx. And we're also got em we've got embedded resource that's working very closely with the local authorities in Greater Manchester on their local area energy plans. And we seek to strengthen that as we go into ED2. Our business plan really covers three broad areas. Um, the first is the transition to net zero, which I think will come as no surprise. We're providing really what we're doing with this is we're providing additional network capacity, either through flexibility or through um, investing in assets. We're supporting customers as a trusted impartial advisor on their low carbon journey. And we're decarbonizing our own operations. And entwined with all this, we are de deploying um, full, we seek to get full deployment of the DSO concept during ED2. In fact, we launched our DSO directorate uh, at the end of last year. 
So that's transition to net zero. Um, the next area is improving the performance of our network, and we're doing this from an industry leading position. Um, our network out, outside of London is the most reliable in the UK, but we are seeking to reduce the number and duration of power cuts by 20% during ED2. Uh, we're seeking to improve resilience, um, and we're also looking to have no worse served customers by the new uh, definition that Ofchem have, uh, have, have produced by 2028. So what we're doing here is really trying to level up the quality of our supply across, across the region. And we've got this particular focus on cyber, storm, storms, floods, and also the resilience of our workforce. We're all, the third area is strengthening our customer service. Um, this is going to be a challenge because we're moving into an environment where we're looking at significant growth. We need to handle growing demand, we need to handle more customer connections. We need to keep it simple and make it efficient. So that's where we're focusing. But we also need to provide support for the vulnerable through collaboration with partners. Uh, and as I said earlier, we have many customers in vulnerable circumstances in our patch. And uh, our broad range of customers have asked us to try and support them. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to be doing. We've also got some innovations in there to reduce costs to our customers through innovations like Smart Street. So you, you might ask, this is quite an ambitious plan. In fact, it's a very ambitious plan. So how do we live with, do we deliver live with this at, at, at low cost? Well, I think first thing to say is our track record speaks for itself. Our ED1 plan was assessed as the most efficient at the outset. And thanks to our focus on efficiency, we remain the lowest cost to serve to the end of ED1. And what we seek to do in ED2 is build on this low cost base. Uh, and based on the published data for the ED2 plans that have been submitted, we remain the lowest cost to serve at just under £80 per customer, which we are very proud of as it underpins our ambitious plan. So overall, the plan invests £1.8 billion, uh, creates at least 1,000 jobs um, and generates a billion pounds worth of social benefit. Um, I might add that many of our, although our, our bills actually come down with this ED2 proposal, many of our customers were willing to pay more to secure these benefits and support the vulnerable in particular. So that has guided our proposal. So let me move to storms briefly before I close. I think the recent storms have certainly highlighted some shortcomings in both communication and resilience. Um, but um, you might be surprised, they've also had, so we've had some great successes, which are not quite highlighted in the media typically. Um, we lost 93,000 uh, 93, customers lost supplies with um, Storm Arwin, but we had similar storms in 97 and 98, where up to a quarter of a million people lost supplies under very similar circumstances. So why the difference? Well, basically improve resilience uh, measures through this ETR 132 standard, which puts in clear cut tree felling standard on circuits feeding population centers of greater than 4,000 has been put in place. And that protected the supply to many customers. And I'll come back to this standard in a, in a minute. So of the 93,000 customer, 93, customers that lost supply, 84,000 were restored in 48 hours, but that meant 9,000 didn't. Um, and in fact, 4,800 were off for greater than 72 hours. So the, the issue for us really, I think, coming out of this is that initially over ambitious restoration times to these customers at the tail end of the event misled many customers and we need to do a better job of that. Um, we need to do that through a variety of communication channels, but also provide more clarity and accuracy in, in, the, in, in the messages that we give. I'm pleased to say that we've, Put, a, put in some improvements already, and we saw a big improvement in our performance in Eunice and Franklin, but there's still more to do. The other area, coming back to this resilience standard, um, is ETR 132. We think this could be extended to benefit smaller rural communities. Of the 4,800 people that were off for over 72 hours, nearly all these were in small communities fed through, uh, fed through or, or were housed in densely wooded areas. So we think if we extended the 132 um, standard, um, it could protect more communities, 
um, and there'll be a trade-off on costs and tree removal, which is never easy. So we're discussing at the moment with Offshore and Bayes the review of this standard. Um, this is not in our plan currently, but I think it, it does it does warrant a serious look. Um, we're also doing some work outside of uh, our work with, with Offshore and Bayes to deploy some innovation to auto reconnect customers in these small rural communities where the storm damage is temporary in nature and fuses blow and they will reinstate the fuses straight away. So that's another piece of work we're doing, but I'm happy to talk about the storms later. So to conclude, I think our track record speaks for itself. Our innovations, efficiency and performance set the benchmark for other networks to follow in many areas. We're ready to lead the Northwest to net zero. And we know from our work that our customers and stakeholders support our plan. Thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. That was a brilliant way of uh, setting the uh, agenda for today from uh, Energy uh, uh, Electricity Northwest's uh, perspective. A couple of comments in the chat about the acronym heavy nature of this conversation. And it's really hard. I know how difficult it is for everybody who spends their time thinking about this all of the time using those shortcuts. But one of the really key things, and as Peter, as Peter you said, communications is going to be key making sure that we can all have a conversation about how we change the energy system um, is really important. And that requires both distribution network operators and Ofgem and indeed the other players to simplify our language, to make it easier for us all to understand each other. So I'm really looking forward to making sure that this is the beginning of that kind of conversation. On the basis of that, I'm hoping that Jonathan will be able to do exactly that. Um, Jonathan, the chief executive of Ofgem, it's lovely to see you here on this call today. Absolutely delighted that you can address some of the challenges and indeed opportunities that there are that we're facing when meeting the requirements of the science when it comes to net zero in the context of extraordinary external pressures on the on the energy system, which are therefore also putting consequent uh, putting uh, uh, impacts on businesses and residents. And, uh, who are both, of course, consumers of the energy that we need to keep our economy going. Jonathan. Thanks, Polly, and lovely to see you, and really happy to be here on this panel. Um, and I will do my best to either avoid acronyms or at least explain as we go through. You know how hard that is for energy people in general and off gem in particular. But we'll see how we go. And I'm also supposed to be super strict on time. And I didn't <laughs> mention it because Peter was super strict on his time. So you have literally <laughs> got 10 minutes, no more. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, Polly. Um, so look, I'm, I'm actually going to start by focusing on, on the broader context at the moment. I mean, I cannot come to an energy event without talking about what is happening in the wider market. I actually want to start by just expressing, you know, off gems thoughts and concern around what's happening in Ukraine specifically. And we have staff members who have relatives and friends both in Ukraine and in Russia. And it is something that we are preoccupied by as an organization. But as you can imagine, the impacts on the energy market are very, very serious. You know, we are seeing extreme changes in prices and we are seeing extreme volatility as a result of the situation that the world finds itself in. And Ofgem will continue to work with the industry to make sure that we protect customers through this difficult time. I also just want to touch up front on something that Peter mentioned around the other part of the winter we've had and Storm Arwin and the response to, to that of, of, of all network companies and without sort of focusing on one in particular, but customers have had a difficult time through, through this. You know, there have been customers who were off for longer than, we, than all of us would like. And I think there will be many lessons to learn from the industry. And so when we begin to, to think about how we evolve this system, so how we move to the longer term, then, then what both these things reinforce are the importance of the basics in our energy system. So we absolutely need a system that evolves to net zero. It's my view that the economics of the market now are driving that change sort of further and faster. You know, the economics mean that there's a greater imperative to make sure we make the transition towards net zero technologies, not least because of the cost comparisons that are in the market today. But it is equally important that we manage costs as best we can on behalf of our customers. And I was really pleased to hear Peter talk about the role of efficiency in doing so. And finally, you know, something that I think we'll need to focus on in the context of a changing weather system is the resilience of our systems and making sure that we are genuinely meeting customers' needs as we go through that journey. Now, as Peter has said, the Northwest is well placed to do that. We have some very ambitious targets, both in Cumbria and in Greater Manchester, 20, 37 versus 2038. 
Um, but it's encouraging to see that there is a great local push to make all this happen. And we Ofgem aren't waiting to fund it, but already funding some of the changes now. So two, I just mentioned through our Green Recovery Fund, we're funding 20 million pounds worth of development. And indeed we have the Great Electricity Northwest Smart Street Initiative, which is a good example of how we might make things more efficient as we make the journey that, that we intend to go on to a more efficient, lower cost and lower carbon system. Now we in Ofgem are looking obviously at the macro picture here about how you might make this change and how you might make the, the, the transition we're going to need from petrol cars to electric cars, how we're gonna make the transition we might need to our homes. And we are very convinced that this is a more localized system. This is a more differentiated system across the country. And therefore the involvement of all local actors in a local planning process that creates that vision and builds that vision for a particular area is extremely important. And we know that particularly as we go through this next phase of change, where the behavior of customers, the types of things people put in their homes, the types of streets we have are gonna become more fundamentally important than they've ever been before. And if I look back and I think about the changes we've made already with renewables, a lot of that was at the large scale and a lot of that was sort of planned through national incentives. I, I accept and we accept that that's gonna change over time. And that's something that we want to be a part of and we want to have a broader and wider conversation about how the market and the regulatory arrangements might adapt to, to take that into account. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, let's look at our regulation. So I'm gonna demystify ED2. So the first of Peter's acronyms. <laughs> so basically that is the local network plan. That is the plan that will deliver all the services that we need to make sure we connect our cars, that we can light our streets, that we can keep our appliances going and ultimately that we can heat our homes if we want to through electricity. Now, Peter's worked up a plan and, and he's, he's, he's sort of demonstrated the benefits of that. Our job will be to work with him to go through that plan and make sure that it genuinely meets customers' needs. Now, we know that Peter has already taken extensive local consultation to drive that plan, but we want to continue that conversation. And indeed, we'll be having something we're describing as open hearings, which are sessions where anybody can have a look at what, what the plans are and make suggestions for change and improvement. I'd encourage people to sign up for that because it's a great opportunity for us to hear how you feel about their plans. And indeed, for anybody who wants to challenge any assumptions, wants to say they can do things differently, this is the forum on which we'll do it. Now, what we Ofgem will do is we will do our job by the middle of the year, we will be putting in draft what we think the, the, the right settlement should be, and ultimately we'll finalize that by the end of the year. And I do think this time, that piece of network regulation is extremely important because it really will be driving what's needed locally and that next phase of that transition to a cheaper, more resilient and low carbon system that we need. The second thing I've mentioned as part of that though, to demystify the second acronym is what Peter referred to as the DSO. Now, what do we mean by that? Look in really, really simple terms. We have a choice if we make this change, we can either build a whole pile of new wires and we can accept that at six o'clock at night, people like me are gonna plug in their cars, light, put their lights on, put their TVs on and cook their dinner all at the same time. And we can build a system that's big enough to do that. It just will be very, very expensive. So what we think we need to do is we need to drive the use of new technologies, of data, of electricity storage, such as batteries, particularly all those cars on the roads, to make sure we do that as cheaply as possible. And if you just shift that demand a little bit in time, so if we just basically store it at times when use is low and use it at times when use is high, we think you can dramatically reduce the cost of the trans that transition. And the DSO is a function that allows network companies to plan that locally and to make that change locally. And we do think that is a fundamental importance to achieve the objectives that I described, not only in terms of getting to low carbon, but doing so in the most efficient way possible. And what we really want to see is a level playing field between generation, network services, and other technologies to allow that to have to evolve and to allow that to happen. Um, and finally, I just want to say a little bit about Ofgem. You know, you know, we do recognize this change is becoming more local. And as a result, we are going to need to engage ourselves differently. So we would like to engage much more fully at a local level and describe the things that we're doing at a local level, both in terms of the meetings we have, the conversations we have, the work that we do, but also in the way that we're communicating. So as part of ED2, we're thinking not only about how we describe all this in the national press, but how we begin to work with the local press to make sure we can both express our intention and hear people's feedbacks and the sorts of things they want to see. 
So with that, all I want to say is, you know, we are fully behind this change. We know it's going to be local. We know the Northwest has a really ambitious and exciting role to play. And we'd like to work with you on that. Have I hit my time, Polly? You have. I'll if I that. had if I had gold stars to hand out, I would hand one out because that's amazing. Oh, yeah. You managed to absolutely hit you. But um, when I used to work in broadcasting, we would say what you managed to do is not not crash the pips. So well done, <laughs> um, which is the worst thing you can do. Um, now, I'd like to move on. Thank you so much both to Jonathan and to Peter, which um, both for making it so clear what we need to talk about today. Now we've got an opportunity for um, our business and consumer panel to pose some questions back to Jonathan and Peter about what they've heard. So I'd like to introduce Henry Morrison, the director of the Northern Power Powerhouse Partnership, Joe Lappin, the chief executive of Cumbria LEP, Emma Degg, the uh, chief executive of the Northwest Business Leaders Team, Andy Manning from Citizens Advice, and Adam Scorer, who is the chief executive of National Energy Action. I'm gonna take you in that order, if that's all right with you guys. And bearing in mind, we've got about 20 minutes. I'd like some pretty focused, pointed questions. If you can say who you'd like to ask the question to, that's even better. And I'll go around to you five, and then I'll give Jonathan and Peter an opportunity to respond to those questions. So first up is Henry. Henry? Thanks so much, Polly. Um, lovely to be here. And I think my question really is, is both to Jonathan, but also to Peter. And it's, it's about the regulatory construct uh, and how it affects the whole energy system. So it isn't specific just to electricity, it covers the whole, the whole system. And I was in Liverpool yesterday, we're doing a number of, of roundtables today and tomorrow, and Emma's kindly joining us later and a few other faces. So uh, thanks to those who've made the time to do that. And, and what came out of the session we did in Liverpool yesterday was businesses and wider stakeholders, including Steve Rother and Metro Mayor, concerns that an economic regulatory system that was designed by government to control an asset that was essentially already built post privatisation is inherently the wrong approach to dealing with this challenge, which requires. Uh, a very much more uh, expansionist mindset and the risk of stranded assets of course and of uh, investment coming before need needs to be thought about and it needs to be controlled for but I'm not entirely sure that the current regulatory construct that Jonathan you've been given by central government is the best approach for doing it um, and uh, as much as I I think that, that, that you've come up with a system of volume drivers that might potentially deal with that issue in this price control period, it feels like the wider regulatory construct still isn't really fit for purpose. And that's not about how you as Ofgem are behaving, it's the system you've been given to manage because clearly you're no longer just gonna be an economic regulator in the traditional price control model. You're no longer gonna just be interested in keeping prices low, you're gonna be interested in keeping the lights on. And my fear is that in a few years time, any of us who have any role in this system, including the network companies, are gonna wake up one morning and, and people are going to be, be shouting at them in the newspapers because they can't get their electricity, if that makes sense. And it feels like uh, it's not you, it's not just the industry, it's central government as well, have got to grapple with whether the current model of regulation is the right model. And I don't know necessarily that can be fixed within this price control period, but it feels like we do need to have a conversation about what the regulatory construct needs to look like, not just for this coming decade, but into the 2030s as well. And I know you've got asked on your plate, Jonathan, so that's not to, to say that I don't I realise you've got a busy job, but it feels yeah. like some of us outside this, this discussion and who are uh, observers to some extent and informed observers, some of us, uh, who take a lot of interest in it, need to support you to make the case for a different regulatory construct going forward. Right. Okay, that's great, Henry. Jonathan, I'll just take the other questions before we get back, but I'd like other people to be sure to, Henry, you remember you've got a panel that you've got things to say to, um, later, but I agree with you. Let's change the rules. Uh, Joe Lappin, please, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Um, question for Jonathan. We are very fortunate in that we have a very productive, strategic and operational relationship with ENW. But one of the challenges that we face is about resilience of the network, particularly in Cumbria. Yeah. And some of the things that we would like to see happen are prohibitive in terms of cost. So how can you factor the specific needs of different geographies? And, and second point I'd like to raise is how do we enable the uh, major, because there will still be a requirement for major, major energy uh, generation schemes to happen in a way that is not putting all of the responsibility on businesses to meet costs. So they're my two questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Thank you Joe. Emma. 
I'm sorry, I lost my mute button. Mute button. Uh, my question was just similar to Joe's, really, in terms of how uh, how significantly can you come up with a place based settlement which is distinct for different parts of the UK? That's great, and I'm going to go straight to Adam because I don't think we've got uh, um, Andy on the line. Adam. Oh, okay. Um, a question for Peter as the author of the draft business plan and Jonathan as the key audience for it. So we know we're working with lots of DNOs about the, the contribution to identifying vulnerability through priority service registers, deploying domestic energy efficiency as not just network reinforcement, um, connections to enable low income households to move to low heat uh, technologies. So Jonathan, you've got all the draft business plans now you've had a chance to kind of see how well or badly different uh, DNOs are doing against those sorts of areas. Are you content with what you've got or are there areas where you expect to see better outcomes, especially in the context we're in at the moment? Great. Um, I'm going to ask Peter to answer first and then Jonathan. And uh, if I can sort of ask you to basically keep your comments to about two two and a half minutes if that's all right so we can keep on track i've got a very good question in the chat as well can anyone please advise what place-based settlement means <laughs> i think that'll be another one for the jargonometer and uh, let's see if we can get that from uh, from our uh, from our contributors now i mean and if not then we might come back to a bit later because i and i feel your pain on that one okay so i've got two and a half minutes to answer <laughs> two and a half minutes to answer even even henry's question would be ambitious um, I have to say, uh, we've engaged with Ofgem um, over, well, and Jonathan and his team over the last two to three years to emphasise the fact that the approach needs to change because we're, in, we're not in a, a flat or declining demand environment anymore. It's growing, which means you need flexibility. Um, and the approach that Ofgem are taking is to use uncertainty mechanisms. The, the issue, I think, will be responsiveness um, because... Um, if we start to see things moving quickly, say in Greater Manchester or, or in Cumbria or parts of Lancashire, that we need to then invest quite quickly and we have not got the resources in place to do that, we will need a quick response from Ofgem. So I think the, the framework is there, um, how that actually manifests itself when the final determinations uh, uh, come, come through. Is, is, is still unclear and Jonathan should, should be answering that. But I think that the, the current construct, if we are work together flexibly, can deliver. Um, in terms of the, the, the Cumbrian questions, interesting. I, I know it was aimed at Jonathan, but a lot of this is to do with, again, speed of response. In this case, it's national grid because there's a, there's a ring main around Cumbria and it's effectively hamstrung by grid capacity. So how quickly can National Grid as the, as the transmission operator respond to investment need? That needs to come out in, the, in these discussions. Um, Place-based settlement um, mentioned twice. To my mind, we've tried to come up with a place-based proposal. We have consulted widely. Many people on this call know how much effort we put into it. Um, our local uh, customer engagement group have been supportive. They've seen the customer engagement. Um, we, we know it's slightly different than other parts of the country because we are different. I've talked about the fuel poverty in the region and also the ambitions. So um, we'll see whether our place-based proposal um, is, uh, is received with a place-based response. So we we'll wait to see. Um, and the energy efficiency one, and again, it was aimed at Jonathan, we, we aren't in directly involved in domestic housing efficiency, but we are working, particularly in Greater Manchester, with their retrofit GM task force, which will publish its policy um, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time. And this is all about trying to get homes energy efficient, which will be enable electric heat um, or potentially hydrogen heat, depending on, on where policy goes. But it's an important piece of work, and we have factored that work into our uh, strategic infrastructure plans. So. We are involved in a lot of this work and it's 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 giving us real visibility on where we are likely to need to um, add capacity over the next few years. But this will be dynamic. And again, you're back to the flexibility point. Can our relationship with Ofgem be flexible enough that they can respond to the needs we're seeing quickly uh, and put resources in place where it's required? That's it. Uh, that's great, Peter. Can I just ask one question, just sort of in relation to what you said about, uh, but to, in response to Henry's question, 
I think what you said was that you think you can get what you need to do within the current rules. Is that right? I well, I, I think in certainly over the over the five years, twenty three to twenty eight. I think we can start this journey with one or two of the tools that we're working on with Ofgem now that can deliver the plan. Um, there needs to be a change in perhaps the degree of trust uh, to delegate some of that, but and uh, together with some checks and balances. But I think it is deliverable. Um, but until we really get into the journey and we see connections start to go through the roof, EVs being deployed at, at, at scale, um, I think the, the current approach can work. Um, but it needs to be tested and it will be tested. That is my view. OK, I'm just interested because I think the rules need to radically change in order to be able to allow Jonathan and his team to do much more to shape the form of the energy, uh, the energy system to meet the realities of, of both mm. net zero and these questions about resilience and fuel poverty and so forth. People's bills are going to go up potentially by 200% in the next year or so. And we want to be able to achieve net zero. Net zero should be a driver to reducing those bills. Where yeah. on earth is the national mission for energy efficiency? Yeah. I only say that I'm abusing my position as chair. And so just because I knew I had 30 seconds to spare. Jonathan, thank you for that, Peter. We had 30 seconds to spare because of you. Jonathan, it's your go. I think you've taken my two and a half minutes, Polly. Um, <laughs> Not so at all. Very quickly, very quickly. Um, does the regulatory construct need to change? Look, I, I think that the... I'd make it a bit broader than that. I think the market governance needs to change. Now, you know, we are at the national level sponsors of the future system operator. And the whole aim of that, coming back to the tenor of the question, Henry, is around generating a holistic approach to the way you're thinking about this. Now, I don't think you're going to see a you're going to see an efficient change in our heating system and our transport system without having a body that can drive that whole plan. And the ESO are already doing some of that at the national level by creating, for example, the integrated onshore offshore grid, which is you know, a much more strategic approach than, than the way we've taken things so far. I think some of those lessons probably do need to be learned at the local level. We will need to find a way to have a holistic view of the sort of transition we're making locally because they're gonna be very different. So um, I'm gonna, we, we've invented a new acronym, PBS, place-based settlement, that's brilliant. <laughs> so, but, but to expand on that, I mean, in really simple terms, what you need in Cornwall, in the new world may be very different to what you need in the Northwest, not, not least because the, the legacy infrastructure is very different, the local conditions are very different. And therefore my view is when you really think about how you're gonna change your transport system, how you're gonna change heating of people's homes and the efficiency of people's homes in a cohesive way, I can't see how you do that without a lot more local coordination. And that might need a different framework to do it. On resilience, um, we are doing work on not only on resilience through ED2, but looking at the question of whether um, resilience becomes increasingly challenging in a world where our weather is, is changing. And, um, you know, we do expect to make sure that that is part of the settlement. Though the one important thing to say is we will not be able to build a system that guarantees we don't have power cuts. So an important part of Peter's job is not only to make sure the network is as resilient as it should be, but also to make sure the response to those events is well coordinated, well managed, and well communicated and that's something that i'm sure we'll be saying as part of our um as part of our response to storm arwin um and then last thing you know should companies go further and faster on on all the issues that you raised adam we're, we're still going through it but we are encouraging companies to think very broadly about the goals for customers and i'm sure that's something that we'll be opining on in june and adam i look forward to seeing you at the open hearings How's that? That's great. No, that was fan absolutely fantastic. And we're absolutely on track. Amin has asked some really interesting questions in the chat. I think they're factually based mostly for Jonathan. So I think it's probably best for Jonathan maybe to take those questions offline and see if you can reply to them. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's about funding of DSOs and allocation of funds per, per customer and so forth, um, which I think are probably some issues around equity. But also, as we know, this isn't just a North South thing. It's as much to do with the differences in uh, energy potential and energy demand within regions yes. um, and intensity of, uh, of both of those things in different places. Um, I certainly know that in various, in various different parts of uh, the country, you've got high levels of demand and, in uh, um, and, and, and somewhere else, a high level of potential to generate. And we're going to have to balance that system in a much more locally based way than we've ever really thought of before. 
Um, I'd like to move on, therefore, to opening up the conversation um, amongst the, that um, business and consumer panel. I'm going to go in reverse order, if that's all right, just because I know that Henry's had a bit of a go, and I'd like to start with Adam. So, Adam, if you uh, would, if you wouldn't mind starting, just your your overall thoughts on this, and then I'll go up. Uh, I'll go up the list. Um, Adam, Emma, Joe, and then Henry, and we've got until half past eleven. It's nothing like a last minute reverse in order to put you on your on your toes. I guess there's three very general challenges and three possibly more specific challenges. I suppose the first one, and it's been referenced kind of already, every worst case energy scenario that you could you could imagine in your most hyperbolic moments has been realized and surpassed over recent days. And I don't think I need to go through the, the consequences of a 2,700 to 3,000 pounds average bill on levels of fuel poverty, especially in the areas of the country that have the highest rates already, like the Northwest. Specifically in relation to net zero and leveling up, for National Energy Action or a fuel poverty uh, charity, there is no pathway to net zero that doesn't pass through the homes of the poor, people on the lowest incomes and in the least efficient homes. And the third general challenge is that, that while most of government direct funding is for energy efficiency, domestic energy efficiency is directed towards households on, on low uh, incomes. We know that the scale of that doesn't even match the manifesto commitments and it's inadequate to the, to the, the, to the, to the challenge, but also the timeframes constrained by parliaments is just entirely inadequate. So we don't have the money and we don't have the longevity of it. So the challenge is absolutely enormous. In relation to this, uh, conversation. I think there's probably about four kind of big challenges I'd like to, to reference for low income, low, least efficient homes in relation to, to, to ENWL. Um, the, the first I think is, and I referenced it earlier, is connections. We have an enormous kind of challenge about enabling, putting the preconditions and necessary conditions for, trans, for transferring low income households, especially in rural areas, to to low carbon heating, and it's the, the, the cost of the, the connections to enable a heat pump. And so there's something there about making sure that low income households are not, uh, don't have obstacles to being able to be part of that net zero transition because of the cost of the, uh, of the, of the connection. I think the, the second one is, I think there's about 300,000 households in the Northwest on a prepayment meter. They get hit earliest, they get hit hardest, they have the least levels of service. There's something about the acceleration and the prioritization of smart meters and then the, the smart uh, prepay tariff solutions that just has to be led. It's so important that we get that, um, that sorted out. I was pleased to hear what Peter was saying about the role that, net, that DNOs and DSOs can play in uh, energy efficiency solution, but I think we need every player uh, at a regional basis to be able uh, to do that. And I think my point would be not only is the, the scale of government funding inadequate and the timescales too foreshortened, that means that I think we just do need to look to regional and local actors to make sure that all the levers that could be pulled in order to get us out of the fuel poverty solution, the public health inequality, Kind of educational achievement and workers pr productivity by working in a by living in a, a warm safe home are utilized so i would love to see the consequence of these sort of discussions that we don't regard the uh challenging fuel poverty as well if we do energy efficiency therefore there's a there's a knock-on impact on fuel poverty we have to build it in to regional and local plans that we are aiming to release the benefits systemically and regionally of having warm and safe homes in educational achievement, productivity, NHS uh, costs directly, as well as the health and well-being. So I think the, the DNOs and DSOs have a vital role to play in enabling that transition to a net zero and a leveled up society. But I just don't think yet we've got either the prioritization or the acceleration for the measures that are available to us kind of at the heart of our plans. I think we've still got a lot of work to do. Thanks, Polly. That's great. Thank you so much, Adam. I think as that's a, a lot of uh, important challenges back not only to the energy um, players on this call, but other people who really, I think we're, we're starting to build a kind of consensus 
which we need to therefore be able to shape to go to government to say these are the rules that need to change this is the role that we think there is for government and this is the role there is for the private sector but i'm sure we'll hear more about the private sector particularly from our next contributor um emma degg emma thank you very much but it very much follows on from what adam just said really um because i do think this is the key issue for us at the moment is how are we going to be honest about the pain that the necessary pathway to net zero um, is going to, to inflict if we don't get serious about just transition and serious about the investments that are going to be required, really. Um, so from an industrial point of view, um, this panel's about challenges, so I won't talk about the opportunities, but we've got lots here in the Northwest. But Net Zero Northwest that I sit on, that is the major industrialist, to give you an idea of the scale, um, over the last 12 months, just four of those high energy um, consuming companies have had their bills rise by a billion pounds. And that's before the tragic events that are happening in Ukraine. This is, you know, unbelievable magnitudes of impacts that those companies are experiencing. Um, and if we don't do something about a long-term energy strategy, that provides long-term security and long-term investment, then we're going to lose that really important production. And that production is going to impact upon consumers and is also going to impact upon the poor because that's everything from food production um, through to the production of medicines when it affects the Northwest. So we do have some ideas about that that we would like to talk to Ofgem about, but I'd, but I'd say this, none of those businesses are wanting to see a rolling back of commitments to net zero and a rollback from COP, not one of them. And we're in danger of losing the political impetus if business and everybody on this call doesn't come together to have that honest conversation about how we balance fuel poverty, net zero, resilience of supply, and how as a community and how as a country that we're going to do that. Um, and there are enough uh, siren voices across the political spectrum who are saying, yes, net zero, yes, COP was lovely, but the world has changed and uh, we can't afford to do this now. And we can't afford to get to net zero uh, and do the things that we need to do just when the sun is shining, can we? So for me, that's the issue. For me, that's the issue for everybody on this call to be talking about. But that is going to require some really serious honesty um, and the time for uh, ducking those questions and ducking that, that serious investment has gone really. So thanks, Polly. I think that I think that's uh, very important. And also the point that Kevin Freer from Lancaster Council has raised in the chat, that the cost of not doing this now will be much greater later on. And that's where, how we have to counter the siren voices. The opportunity for us actually to be seizing this challenge to turn it into something what we do we've always said we should which is tackle energy efficiency every single home in this country and every single building has never been more uh, more uh, salient so can i hear from can we hear from joe lapin from uh, cumbria lep Joe. Yeah, that's, thank you, Polly. And I think I've drawn the let short straw getting the challenges rather than the opportunities. Eyes. I'd be far rather talking about the opportunities, because certainly as in Cumbria, Lep are doing a lot on both supporting clean energy generation and business decarbonisation. Um, however, as Emma said, there is a need to seriously recognise the significant challenges that our businesses are facing in terms of moving to net zero. The business base now is dealing with the after effects of the pandemic, a more challenging environment on international trade. And that's before we add in the very serious implications of the issues in the Ukraine. But firstly, I want to say and echo exactly what Emma said. Our businesses are absolutely committed to net zero. They are really keen to decarbonise the businesses, both from the perspective of this being the right thing to do, but also because of the urgent and pressing need to reduce energy costs. In the LEP, together with the partners, we completed a major survey of businesses that identified 80% of responders 
absolutely considered the environmental implications of decisions, either sometimes or predominantly always. And that equated to 12,000 businesses in Cumbria. 70% of them were absolutely doing things to minimise their environmental impact with larger businesses more likely to do this. What we also found is that those businesses that were very forward focused, innovating, growing employment, trading electronically, were again more likely to make this move. Um, importantly, there was also agreement to the statement that businesses should spend more to reduce their environmental impact. But I think this needs to be set against a backdrop of 30 year high on inflation, labour supply issues, supply chain challenges, lumen NI increases and soaring energy and fuel costs. Margins are being massively squeezed and some businesses are far more indebted than they were pre pandemic. However, at headline level, the main concern of businesses is the roadmap, plans and investment necessary to deliver net zero. This was recognised by the Public Accounts Committee this week, which concluded that government still has no clear plan for how the transition to net zero will be funded or how it will replace income from taxes such as fuel duty and no reliable estimate of what the process of implementing the net zero policy is actually likely to cost consumers, households, businesses, or government itself. The 2050 target is now enshrined in law, so these plans really do matter, particularly to businesses who will have to meet the costs needed to comply with the legislation. But moving to real businesses grappling with this on the ground, what gets in the way? Firstly, funding support. The, the current um, grant system gives next to nothing to businesses to help them to move to net zero. If we put that against the financial challenges that businesses are facing in the here and now, how do they prioritise this over and above when returns are years down the track? Another challenge is getting the right solution. What's the best solution for my particular business and how do I do the right thing rather than the convenient thing? There's a concern that advisors sometimes sell their product rather than the best product. And that's why we really need decarbonisation by design. Technology, for some businesses, technology to decarbonise is not yet there. Replacing gas in processes decarbonising some forms of transport, et cetera, don't have solutions. So we need to be realistic and balanced about what we can achieve and by what timescales. Another thing we've talked already about Storm Arwen, resilience really matters. What we saw is some business was throughout connection for over a week. So increased reliance on electrification is not without risk. How do we make sure that investments in the resilience of the grid prioritised in the move to, to net zero. And finally, there needs to be a focus on hearts and minds. If we are to deliver net zero, we need a shared language, clear and deliverable strategies and investment plans. Business is absolutely committed, but we need to work collaboratively to develop serious proposals to make it happen. Warm words will not get us there. Thank you. Thank you. That's brilliant, Jo. Um, there, was so, there, was so, there was so much in there. I was thinking, oh, I want to talk about that, but we'll leave it till a little bit later. Um, we've got uh, Henry. Um, we've got uh, just a little bit more time for you, and then we will be um, hearing from Lord Deben. Henry. Thanks so much. Uh, really appreciate it, Polly. And I think that my kind of my reflection really would be that so much has been said. I would agree with that. I think ENW has such a critical role and so do the other networks. Uh, and we heard that kind of discussion during the debate um, that we've just had. And I, I think my, my reflection would be really, Polly, that the, the challenge we've all got to grapple with is that I think that the business do, and I absolutely agree with, with what Joe and, and Emma were saying, do want to do this uh, and want to make the right decisions. And in a sense, got right and it's that uncertainty that's the challenge right for networks because i think 
what they require is often a degree of certainty to be able to justify investment. And at the moment, we've not been able to give enough certainty about the exact detail of exactly what's going to happen. And some of that comes from government. Some of that does come from the fact that we don't want to overcommit to things that might not necessarily be a solution too early on, right? And that's a legitimate thing to do. And so I think in that balance, what we want to be able to do is to have the ambition to say, well, in the next 12 months, we're going to do these things. And in the next 12 months, we're going to... But this business plan has to be set for a period of time uh, in terms of the regulatory settlement, uh, in the case of BMW, for a lot longer than that. And we don't have real certainty over what that decarbonisation pathway will actually look like. We've got a range of scenarios, which are the best that evidence can give us, but they are only scenarios. And I think, uh, and to liken this to the wider challenges in the business community, I think that there are lots of businesses who um, have never really had to engage with the fact that there really is an electricity network, apart from really large producers, uh, rather, sorry, large, large, large independent businesses. And it was just something that was always there. I think businesses are starting to realise, anyone who's tried to, I mean, who's gone through the connections process, whatever, for their, their solar panels on their roof, whatever it might be, suddenly there's a lot more visibility of the role of the, of the, of the DNO and has had a lot more exposure to what it means in terms of being an enabler for them to do what they want to do. And I think whether it's those businesses that are trying to work to tackle the need for a charging solution across the north, whether it's those businesses that are in, in more industrial applications, whether it's about interpreting commun consumer demand or government policy, or whether it's being really clear about what their plans are, I think that there's a huge opportunity for business to collaborate better with the electricity industry on identifying the right solutions. Um, and I think that the risk, and this is the, the reason why it takes us to this point, is that we don't have that right set of relationships and partnerships across industry with, with the industry. Um, so the electricity industry needs to become a much clearer part of the wider kind of local public uh, institutions as private businesses, but ones that have a huge public set of responsibilities. And many of those public responsibilities are ones that require them to work in partnership with the wider business community. So I think that's a really exciting and positive role for DNOs to play. But I think in a culture of post-privatisation, we're very clear that these institutions are now private companies that will run like private companies. We're talking much more about the role of, of a DNO and the wider electricity system, the wider uh, energy system as being something that needs to have lots of public goods at the heart of it. And how you prioritise those public goods and balance them, I think is really tricky. And I think that I don't envy Peter and his colleagues' challenge there because I don't think that's an easy thing to do. Because in the end, socialisation of costs, whether it's across industry or across consumers, is fundamentally about still charging people for something. And I, I do feel like others who've spoken, and, and as you've alluded to, Polly, that the current price increases will lead to a lot of pressure for any investment to be deferred as long as possible. Where in reality, what we know is actually one response to this gas crisis could be installing heat pumps a lot faster within ED1, right? The tail of E1 than anyone expected. And so the starting point for ED2 potentially being very different to what will be examined at the open hearing and is in the draft business plan that EMW uh, prepared and their final submission version. So if you think that the world's going to move even before ED2 begins, potentially quite dramatically, that's a really difficult environment to plan in. And that is a, a really hard balance around what the nation needs could be very different both in industrial terms and from consumers. And that emerging industry that's going to install those heat pumps, that's going to be able to do all the wider retrofit, that's going to install that EV charging infrastructure, that is a nascent industry that we want to support. And we would love for the North to be an early adopter to do that because the scale of the opportunity is that has been done before. The early charging networks were first installed around the Northeast in Cumbria uh, by colleagues while I was there at Newcastle City Council over a decade ago. So we did lead the, we lead, we did lead the country onto this before. It'd be great if we could lead it again. That's a great way to end this, to bring it back to the focus on what needs to happen in this particular region and what the, the opportunities are for the region itself to be able to be leading in finding those solutions. So thank you so much uh, to all of the panel for those contributions. I think um, I'm so pleased it's being recorded because I think there's so much rich conversation that's been had today. Um, 
obviously focused in that conversation on the challenges, but as ever, because people are really knowledgeable and understanding about what the challenges are, they immediately start pointing towards what the opportunities are, which I think is where we, we when things are as, as difficult as they are now, that's always the person who lifts their head and looks to the horizon is always the one who's most likely to get up and find the solution. So I'm really pleased to have those conversations being held here today. So I'd love to uh, now introduce Lord Deben, Lord Deben, the chair of the Climate Change uh, Committee. Um, it's, it's wonderful to have you on the call, uh, Lord Deben. We, um, uh, we know how important your work has been in shaping the national conversation about climate change. Um, the, the committee is extremely uh, helpful for all of us who are trying to change those rules simply by having um, an independent advisory uh, or, uh, institution which is able to say, well, if you don't do it, you do know what's coming. And I'm sure that's one of the things that you'll be outlining to us right now. Thank you so much, Lord Deben. <coughs> well, thank you very much. And I'm very fortunate because I spent Wednesday... Um, in Manchester, um, talking about these very things. We're having a national uh, conversation as, uh, with the Climate Change Committee because I'm very conscious of the importance of the regions and local authorities and local communities if we're going to deliver net zero. Indeed, there is no way of doing that without the continuous partnership at a local level. So I'm very pleased not only to be doing that on Wednesday, but uh, working with you today. And in my private life, I spend a lot of time in the Northwest because we uh, advise um, Everton Football Club on their new stadium and sustainability. So this is uh, a very good, and I was born in Stockport, so I'm very um, keen on what you're doing. Paul and I have had conversations on a number of occasions. Uh, look, uh, I, I want, first of all, just to pick up the conversation up to now. Um, I, I want to say, if he's still with us, to Jonathan Brearley, I, I really do have to say I don't think it's going fast enough. I don't think that Ofgem has recognised just how fast these things have got to go. And I am worried about the uh, degree to which we are not preparing ourselves sufficiently for the pressures that are going to come, nor do I think that we have uh, got ahead of the mechanisms which we are going to need right outside your area, for example, until we actually have a proper ring main where offshore wind can plug in instead of the ridiculous what I call the dad's army mechanism we've got at the moment. We're not going to solve our problems. We've really got to be much more radical. So my first question, first point is that the pressures are going to get worse. And therefore, we have to be more imaginative in uh, what we do. And I think we've got to trust people in their own areas to make a lot more of the decisions which are necessary. And that does mean risk. And I fear that we haven't been sufficiently willing to risk people's um, need for investment, which is an area which is the first one. The second thing is, um, it is going to get worse because every sign in the world is that the cost of energy in the old fashioned sort of energy is going to remain high, if not get higher. Um, Ukraine, of course, this terrible experience has only underlined how very complacent we have been about the world. We have assumed low inflation, we have assumed supply chains that work, we even thought that Brexit could carry through without any real effects. We did all sorts of things which assumed the world would go on. The pandemic and Ukraine broken that very clearly and of course the already high price of energy will be affected very considerably. Um, and when I listen to some people saying, well, because gas prices are so high, we should use more gas, that seems to me to be not a very sensible answer. The idea that somehow or other we shouldn't make the changes to um, the uh, cheaper renewables faster because of the price of gas 
seems to me to be a, a very peculiar way of looking at it. The truth is that if we had already done what Boris Johnson wants us to do by 2030, bills for the average family would be a thousand, would be a hundred pounds a year less, because we have that much more uh, cheaper electricity. And we have to remind people that the cheapest way to produce electricity is renewable. And the quicker we move to it, the better. And we also have to remind people that energy efficiency is not any longer to be treated as a kind of poor relation. And I do agree so much with the points that have been made. Uh, the issue of not just of, um, uh, of fuel poverty, although that is very important indeed, it's also the issue of everybody's ability to pay does depend upon using as little electricity as you need to use to live the kind of life you want. And that's what energy efficiency is about. And I do have to say that the Public Accounts Committee is absolutely right. The government does not have a clear, detailed, understandable programme to reach these ends. Where it's got it, it's working. It's a government we have to say and congratulate on actually understanding what has to be done in terms of aims, in terms of the uh, targets for 2030 and 2035, in terms of its international negotiating stance, all that we have to say is very good. But delivery ain't there. Delivery is the crucial issue. And that's really what you've been talking about and will be talking about today. It's how you deliver net zero. And it's at that point that I want to say that I think delivery of net zero and levelling up is very many ways the same thing. Levelling up demands all the things we have to do to deliver net zero. Because levelling up means we should be having the cheapest form of electricity. Levelling up does mean that we really do have to help those people who are in the poorest circumstances with the least good uh, energy efficiency and with homes that aren't fit for living in. And, and that's why the whole process should be a consolidated process instead of being constantly thought of in the different ways. I talk about climate change now much more in terms of turning to a cleaner, greener, kinder world rather than talking about the threat of climate change. I think it is true that apart from a few uh, absolutely unconvertible individuals, the world understands that climate change is happening. They're experiencing it. They know it's happening, and they also are beginning to understand just how fast it's happening. The issue, though, is that people do not act out of fear. They act out of wanting to improve things. They want to have a positive approach. And my positive approach is that the kind of world you build if you fight climate change is a better world. It's a cleaner world. It's a fairer world. And all that has to come together. And when people talk about um, the need for a just transition, I don't like the word just. It's a fair transition. And if we don't have a fair transition, there won't be a transition at all. It's not a question of morality, although I hold it as a moral demand. It's a question of possibility. You will not do it unless the whole nation feels that it is being done in a fair way. So when it comes to the Northwest, we're talking about a key player in all this. And what is so fascinating is that what we've heard up to now is that the place-based issues, whatever one talks about place-based, the place-based issues just illustrate how complex fighting climate change is. The Cumbrian Ring Main, the proposal, ridiculous proposal, to build a coal mine off Cumbria, the issue of where the next nuclear power station should go, all those are particularised by the nature of the place. 
At the same time, what's happening in Manchester, which is extremely exciting, and I believe that uh, uh, the two great mayors that we have, the mayor of uh, Manchester and the mayor of, uh, of Teesside, are both in, from different political parties really leading the local response to this in a remarkable way. But the problems of Manchester and Liverpool uh, and the problems of Cumbria are wholly different. And we do need to have a regulatory system and a political system which actually recognises that. I want just to end to say there are two words I think we have to hold absolutely close to ourselves. The first, the first is confidence, optimism. We're going to do this. We can do it and we will do it. And the second is Holocaust. And not only Holocaust, but disaster of the worst kind. There is a kind of way of destroying the whole of the race the whole of the human race. And that is if we don't do this properly. We, we really are threatened in a way which has never been threatened before in the sense that we know what is happening and we know what caused it and we know what we have to do. And therefore, this is a fundamental human dilemma. We either do now what we have to do or we condemn future generations to a situation in which they can do nothing. It is a terrible humanitarian challenge, but it's also the fact that human beings know that will enable us to fulfill ourselves as human beings in a way which we've never done before. We've been hit before by things like the Black Death and we didn't know why it was. And one in three of the population died. We know why this is, and we know how to solve it. All we have to do is to get on with it and with an urgency, which we haven't so far actually understood. Thank you so much, Lord Devon. It's always a pleasure to hear you, even when you end with that um, call to arms, which does sound gloomy, but also is actually a call to the, the best in human nature, which is what we need to be um, harnessing at this time. I'm, uh, I'm delighted that you've been able to join us and thank you again uh, for your uh, thoughts and contributions to this, uh, particularly your comments on the importance of delivery and the importance of place, um, because we know that ultimately when we think globally, we have to act locally and that is where we're, well, what we're focused on today. Our next panel is leading the way to net zero, the opportunities that deliver best value. And we've got a range of extremely uh, knowledgeable contributors from a wide range of um, disciplines and, um, and, uh, and areas or indeed of the Northwest. So that we're again, recognizing the variety within the region. Professor Will Swan, who is the lead uh, for Applied Buildings and Energy Research um, at the University of Salford, Miranda Barker, who is the Chief Executive of the East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce. Philip Cox, uh, the Chief Executive of Cheshire and Warrington uh, Local Enterprise Partnership. Diana, Diane Richardson, the Chief Executive of Britain's Energy Close Business Cluster. So we'll hear a bit from Cumbria. Uh, and Jack Richardson, the Senior Climate Programme Manager from the Conservative Environment Network. I'm sorry to say, that Councillor Azar Ali will not be able to join us because we've heard that he has been taken into hospital. So we do send our very best wishes to um, Councillor Ali. Um, and uh, we, will, uh, we will, of course, um, be encouraging, I will, of course, be encouraging contributions when we get to the Q&A, particularly from local government, in order to make sure that that view uh, is uh, reflected in our conversations. But I'd like to start uh, with Professor Will Swan. Everybody's got about between three and three and five minutes so that we can get to that Q&A at uh, five past 12. Professor Swan. Thank you. Um, so where are the opportunities for the Northwest? And I think, um, you know, speaking as a, as a university, as part of the research base, you know, I think uh, although we're living in challenging times, we're living in exciting times because of the research and innovation that, that is being undertaken in this space. So at the University of Salford, um, we're really looking at housing, which which is a big part of uh, a big part of the net zero problem. And I think what we have seen is 
um, an engagement between not just the university doing research, but business, uh, the combined authority, the DNO, um, and all these partners coming together to properly engage with the opportunities that research and innovation can bring. And what we're starting to see is that kind of collaboration, um, certainly in Greater Manchester, but also in the wider Northwest, where we're looking at the problem not just in our own little um, in our own little furrow of just being material scientists or uh, mechanical and electrical engineers or digital people or people who are interested in offsite manufacture, but looking at, at it as part of a bigger um, movement towards innovating some of our way out of this problem. Um, and I'll give some good examples of that. So, you know, if we think about the um, Ener uh, Energy Innovation Agency in Greater Manchester, um, that was about three universities, big business and the combined authority coming together to look at how we could create an infrastructure that could close the, the net zero gap through innovation by supporting businesses, supporting new ideas and bringing them through. And so just great examples like that, or, or the Z House, where uh, Barrett and uh, the University of Suffolk brought 40 business to, businesses together to try and innovate around what a new build house should look like. How can we get that to net zero? And that learning is important because basically it links not only to you know, research and innovation and universities sort of talking to themselves, but it, it links to the innovation cycles in businesses. It builds out to the skills base, and that makes that important. It attracts investment and that clean growth that we're looking to drive. So really, for, for me, the, the really big opportunity is that collaborative working around finding out how to do it. And when we think about solving a problem as a research problem, it then opens up into a skills problem. So, you know, there are lots of people who know how to install um, air source heat pumps properly, but actually, have we got enough to do 600,000 a year? That, opening that out, and actually having those discussions um, and pushing out into the teaching and skills infrastructure from the research and innovation challenge is really important. I think the other thing that, um, uh, that we've experienced recently is because large organizations uh, are getting interested in this space it creates an opportunity to support small businesses and link them if they've got a successful project product or service we can link them with the big supply chain um, organizations that can then push that out rapidly because i think for us really in terms of research and innovation and i'll, I'll, I'll stop very shortly but in terms of research and innovation it's about shortening that chain we can't have a five-year program with a nefarious outcome a vague outcome later down the line we need to think differently and maybe this is a, certainly an opportunity to sort of lobby nationally is things that help us work with people who are going to deliver the problem about universities stepping into their places that they that they live and, and work in and helping really close that time it takes to get innovation and improvement out into the field. And that for me is really about integrated partnerships, about you know, the research base, learning to speak with the people who own the problems and working together to really kind of drive those improvements forward because it is an economic opportunity as much as it is an existential challenge. Thanks very much. Absolutely brilliant to hear you say that, uh, Professor. I know from um, my work with the Prospering from the Energy Revolution program uh, that Innovate UK is leading, what they've identified is that quite a lot of the technologies that we need are already proven, yeah. but we, what we need to do, so we need to stop faffing around thinking it's got to be on a back lot of a university and start translating that stuff that's already proven into reality by dealing with, there we say it, designing it to meet the needs of human beings. And this is that that's about changing, um, ad, ad developing new business models, identifying the, the regulatory frameworks that are limiting our ability to roll this stuff out and simplifying things so that we're not saying, oh, well, can you just go away and invent something? Yeah, you've already invented it. Yeah, just and it's, it's it systems thinking, it's systems thinking and good. I think the research opportunity is research is a contact sport. And we all need to kind of be getting into there, driving out and making sure it's getting adopted. 
Well, and also I'd, I'd like to plug the Place-Based Climate Action Network, which of course Lord Deben helped found, which is developing that partnership between local universities and their local authorities in order to be able to really draw on that local, in, that insight and expertise in the university and make sure that those universities get like that contact sport you're talking about. Brilliant, right, let's hear from Miranda Barker, the Chief Executive of East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce. Miranda. Thank you very much, Polly, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Swan. You, you have um, set me up wonderfully well, because I agree with everything that you said. And I very much want to touch very briefly, both on how to drive and persuade the business audience forward, but also how to accelerate that commercialization of, of low carbon technologies to solve the problems, because these are both areas that we work on. So I'm, I'm the Chief Executive of East Lancaster Chamber, and I also am the chair of a, a, a project um, called REDCAT, which we are very proud to have Electricity Northwest on the board of, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So in terms of moving the business audience forward, like anything, it is a bell curve of those who are early adopters and are already driving ahead and really adopting that, that low carbon technology and seeing really solid business benefits from having done that. And there are those at the back end who will never move until they are being pushed by the energy prices or by carbon taxation. But there's an awful lot that we can do to move the middle of that bell curve along faster. Um, we need to help them in terms of quantifying the opportunity and the threat. And we run programs, there are programs all over the Northwest, um, but we run one called Chamber Low Carbon, which has just won a global award for a climate action project internationally from the Chambers of Commerce. And that's there to help the businesses not only understand what their threat is, but also their opportunity, and then support them with how to put the changes in place. Because that's, that open-ended support isn't always there. But also, we need to fix the problem of how they fund those changes. And we're not saying to government, you need to have an open-ended subsidy or a grant scheme necessarily. There are so many green finance opportunities out there saying, we will help you pay for your heat pump and then you, we will get the money back over year and year and year. The problem is that after the failed schemes of the past, businesses don't know who to trust on that green financing front. So we need some sort of green financing ombudsman to help businesses know that they can take up those sort of loan and return opportunities uh, and that, that can help them incorporate new car low carbon technologies into their businesses. But the third thing that's really needed is for government to step up and make the policy changes that persuade business that it is time now to pick up that low carbon technology. Policy changes that need not cost government a lot of money. So all public sector procurement needs to have a really strong low carbon rationale in there. All planning for new residential or new industrial buildings needs to have a really strong baseline of technologies that must be incorporated nationally so you're not getting displacement. We need to look at really strong things on landfill tax, on minimum recycled percentages in all manufacturing and an energy policy that actually helps the provision going forward to keep pace with the demand that we've got. And we know that we're already short in certain areas now in terms of a provision of energy supply. Where are we going to be when we go to 100% electrical heating and 100% electric vehicles? And we need to support our DNOs in how they're going to get us from here to there. And we're very, very lucky in that we have such a, a proactive and positive uh, support uh, from, from Electricity Northwest, and we need to be informing and driving that argument forward. But in terms of the other side of the coin, the technology piece, how do we do that? We've got, a, as Professor Swan said, huge amount of intelligence in our region um, supporting the innovation and development of new low carbon technologies. What we have a real problem with is the acceleration of those technologies to commercialization. And we need to capitalize on those technologies and support them through the valley of death with funding, through the, the technology viability assessment and trying to channel the investment that is in place um, from our VCs and our equity firms to get those technologies accelerated. And one project I'll quickly mention where we're very lucky to have Paul Bertram from Electricity Northwest on our board is uh, a project called REDCAT, which is funded through the Getting Building Fund, so some of the levelling up funding, and that is there to take those technologies forward. And they're taking forward about one and a half million pounds worth of tech and creating about 10 million pounds over 100 jobs 
at producing low carbon technologies in Lancashire for the benefit of the UK, but also then to export. One of those is an a, a energy air source heat pump, which is geared towards the UK climate. And another is a micro hydro device, which is already being used to power schools in Kenya. So there are the opportunities to do that, but we need to ramp this up. We have the opportunity not, an opportunity not only to lead on decarbonizing our businesses, but also on selling and taking that technology to the world. So it would be great to see us do that. That's a great contribution, um, Miranda. I was nodding vigorously, particularly when you were talking about the Valley of Death, which we've actually done quite a lot of work on um, in uh, at UK 100. And, um, and we're very keen to make sure that the UK Infrastructure Bank provides development capital for precisely that reason. And what I'm slightly shocked about is the amount of times they go, oh, well, no, but there are grants for feasibility studies. And I, the, the local authorities have got feasibility studies coming out of their ears or rather stuffed in the bottom drawer of their filing cabinets because they don't know how to turn a feasibility study into a real, realistic project. And all that sustainable finance is swilling around, desperate to be invested. That requires some patient capital at the early stages beyond feasibility anyway. Um, rant over. Philip Cox, Chief Executive of Cheshire and Warrington uh, uh, Local Enterprise Partnership. Philip. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Pauline. Delighted to uh, nice to be here this morning. And I'm, I think sort of you know listening to sort of some of the contributions earlier, Lord Deben talked about kind of the importance of uh, leveling up. I think other people have sort of talked about sort of some of the opportunities. And uh, I think you know. For me, actually, there's there are some huge opportunities here for the uh, for the north for the northwest. You know, kind of climate change absolutely critical that we uh, that we ta that we tackle it. But a massive opportunity for the northwest to uh, reinvigorate its economy um, and to do sort of a huge amount around uh, around leveling up as uh, leveling up as well. And it's worth saying, just sort of a bit in parentheses, that you know when I talk about the northwest. I mean, sort of the whole of the area covered by electricity northwest, but the, but also Liverpool, sort of rest of Cheshire and Warrington that are covered by a couple of covered by what used to be called Manweb. Um, and I used to think that meant Manchester and West or Northwest electricity, but I'm told it actually meant sort of Merseyside in North Wales. But only, either way, that's now Scottish uh, Scottish power. But I mean, the reason why I think there are so many opportunities is because the wealth of expertise in clean energy technology, uh, sort of in the, in this area. Um, you know, we've got Birchwood in Warrington, which um, sort of is where much of the uh, much of the engineering expertise for the nuclear industry is, is housed. And sort of uh, Rolls Royce have got their design office for their new small modular reactors in uh, in uh, in Warrington. We've got the High Net Hydrogen Program uh, over in uh, over in Ellesmere uh, Ellesmere, Ellesmere Port, uh, which has just had a sort of huge um, uh, grant of funds from uh, from Bayes. To get sort of uh, one of the first two hydrogen uh, sort of at scale hydrogen projects away in the UK, um, sort of uh, Fulcrum Fulcrum are producing sustainable aviation fuel or will be producing sustainable aviation fuel again at Stanlow. That fuel coming from from waste that can't be uh, can't be recycled, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, we've got huge amounts of wind energy uh, out in the uh, out in the Irish Sea. The potential for tidal energy in the uh, in the Mersey estuary with uh, Liverpool City Region and the Combined Authority there putting kind of a lot of money into that, and then um, you know kind of uh, you know Diane's going to talk sort of shortly. You know Cumbria bidding to be the, uh, the host of the UK's first sort of uh, at scale fusion uh, fusion fusion reactor. So it's all it's all here, and some work that uh, Siemens have done for us suggests that there are potentially in the northwest. 660,000 sort of green jobs sort of in this uh, in this area which is absolutely uh, absolutely absolutely huge but if we're going to um but if you know and, and will swan sort of touched on this if we're going to kind of access these jobs we've got to make sure that people have got the training that they uh, they need and that is absolutely critical um and you know, I don't think that the you know a lot of that's going to come from uh, going to come from central government. I don't think at this stage government has quite sort of grasped the sort of the scale of what is uh, what is uh, what is required. Um, we have a bid in at the moment for uh, to DFE for some skills uh, skills boot camps. Um, the size of the bid that we've been entitled to sort of put in, being told we can put in. Will allow us to sort of uh, do some training for uh, you know a couple of hundred people in green skills. That's 
there's quite a difference between a couple of hundred and 660, uh, 60, 60,000. So I think that's, you know, really, really, uh, really, really important. Again, we'll, you know, talked about kind of, you know, there's, there's high-end technology, you know, nuclear and, and so on and so forth, but we'll also touch on, you know, having enough people to install the heat pumps, install electric vehicle charging networks, uh, and I think also crucially in all of that, ensuring that homes are properly, uh, properly, properly insulated. That insulation and some of that heat pump stuff is, I think, another area where sort of, so, you know, leveling up comes from the, you know, training people, getting them into those, uh, into those high skilled, high paid, uh, high paid jobs. I think another area where leveling up um, goes hand in hand with, um, with decarbonisation and net zero is around, you know, bringing all our homes up to the right standard, retrofitting kind of homes, not just in the, the social sector, but actually across um, sort of, you know, across the whole of the uh, whole of society, there are many homes, huge numbers of homes, still well below the standards of insulation that we need. Well below the standards of the insulation that we need if heat pumps are going to be a viable, uh, viable, uh, viable solution. Um, certainly, down the bottom end of the spectrum, kind of bottom end of the distribution, getting funding for for those. You know, we eliminate fuel poverty at the same time as we deliver, uh, deliver, deliver, deliver net zero. Um, I think, kind of. Uh, in terms of what we um, what we need to sort of uh, do and to achieve this, and I, I, unfortunately Jonathan Brearley, who was on, has sort of now dropped off, because I think um, I think you know other people have already talked today about the important role that uh, Ofgem has got to play in all of this, um, and one of the things that is clear, we really don't know how some of this is going to going to play out. We don't know how quickly people are going to kind of, uh, switch to uh, electric cars. We don't know how quickly people are going to sort of switch to heat pumps. We don't know whether, you know, over the next 10 years, somebody will suddenly decide, actually, you can use hydrogen. And actually, we can keep our existing uh, sort of gas boilers going and we'll just simply, simply switch them to all to hydrogen. Consequence of that uh, is that I think that, um, that, you know, if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't kind of strengthen the electricity network and make it possible for people to charge their electric cars, people aren't going to switch to them. Consequence of all of that is that I think that uh, uh, ENW, Scottish Power, the other DNOs, they are going to need to engage in some speculative investments. And some of those speculative investments are going to fail because you know it'll turn out that people don't sort of switch to electric cars or whatever in quite the way that we expect them to, or they don't charge them in quite the way we expect them to. Ofgem is going to need to be prepared to allow kind of ENW and others to make those investments and then to recover the cost of those investments sort of through uh, through the sort of the charges that they are putting on there, putting on putting on putting on consumers they are very very reluctant to do that so we sort of uh, you know we, we, we struggle with more general sort of investment uh, um, at the at the at the moment where kind of uh, you know, in, in practice, if you want to, if you want to add something to the network which tips the network over the edge, you have to then pay for the cost of the sort of strengthening of this net network. We can't sort of uh, that can't that can't uh, that can't be the approach that we take to uh, to net to net zero. But I think with that with that message, I think the kind of the key thing I'd want people to go away from here uh, this morning is just the huge opportunities that we have to make the Northwest a genuine world leader in net zero technology. And in doing so, sort of some huge opportunities to level up at the uh, level up at the same time. Thanks so much, Philip. That was a really useful um, a perspective. I'd like to move on because I know we're we're running short of time. We want to get our Q and A in to Diane Richardson, the chief executive of Britain's Energy Coats Business Cluster. Diane, thank you, Polly. And I think Philip's done a great job there of uh, lining up how Warrington and Cumbria collaborate together in delivering on nuclear decommissioning. And that means we have a supply chain with hugely transferable skills when it comes to delivering on clean energy, whether you're talking about new nuclear build and, and SMR, small modular reactors, whether you're talking about STEP and, and a completely different kind of, of nuclear, which Joe mentioned in the, um, in the chat there. So I think I'm going to take a slightly different approach to um, the things that have been talked about so far and talk about the capability that actually that nuclear industry is driving when it comes to social value around that levelling up agenda. Um, and because of the changes in government procurement that have been driven down through Sellafield into the supply chain here, we've built up in Cumbria a real capability around social value and a place where our 
private businesses, our public sector, um, our charitable sector are working together really closely in order to be innovative around social value and levelling up. Um, and we, along with those other sectors, are working on something called Investing Cumbria Alliance that is about changing the relationship that a community has with the developer. Because we all know there are going to have to be new solutions developed on a fairly major scale if we're going to deliver net zero. And in delivering those, we want to make sure they do also deliver the social value alongside the financial value and the clean energy that we know we all need. Um, and I think that innovative piece and that capability, not just around delivering this, the technical solutions that Warrington and Cumbria can deliver together, but also those pieces that can be often called the soft pieces that are actually the hardest things to deliver. I think in the Northwest, we have a real chance here to be right up front um, and driving through and, and showing people how it's done, how you level up, how you deliver social value alongside technical solutions, alongside financial stability for supply chain companies and deliver a win-win situation for developers, communities and businesses. So hopefully that's a different aspect. <laughs> That is, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Diana. I really appreciate that. And uh, finally, I'll go to Jack Richardson, who's the Senior Climate Programme Manager from the Conservative Environment Network. Jack. Hi, thank you very much, Polly. Um, and thanks very much for having me on a panel with so many great speakers. It's been really interesting uh, hearing what everyone has to say. Um, I'll try and keep it brief because I know that the q and is coming and that's always the best bit. Um, but just say we're the uh, Conservative Environment Network. We're quite a fast organisation, um, an independent forum for conservatives who promote decarbonisation and, and natural restoration. Um, and I have to say that Northwest is probably one of our fastest growing regions. Um, I was up in Cheshire and Wirral recently for a Conservative Association um, uh, event and the amount of uh, people who, who are coming up and talking to us excited about the, the reindustrialization of Britain basically as well as um, natural restoration was um, was really really impressive um, and also some of our, our very best leading MPs in our caucus um, uh, up in the northwest as well like Catherine Fletcher or Andy Carter. Um, I, I thought I'd speak a bit about uh, needing to keep the, the cost down which should be the to be fair, um, business of any government policy anyway. Um, but I think we also need to make it clear that especially now with um, the sort of more geopolitically uncertain world that we're moving into, that net zero is actually the way to drive down the cost of living. So particularly um, as everyone's been, been discussing, I think insulation is probably the first thing that we need to be getting on with as fast as possible right now to reduce the amount of gas that is going straight out of people's well windows and roofs um, to bring down their bills. Um, the way that I think would be good to do that is um, the uh, UK Infrastructure Bank that could maybe make it a priority to the built in to make the built environment a priority. Um, investing more money in the existing schemes that we know already work, like the um, the local authority delivery scheme, the social housing decarbonisation fund to really boost the supply chains um, and get going on that. And then also government working with the private sector to deliver those green retail products like uh, green mortgages, etc. Um, another exciting um, thing that I'm like quite uh, want to see happen um, that hasn't really been discussed yet is, is local pricing. So moving away from this uh, quite old fashioned, I think like probably from the 1950s um, method of charging people for their electricity and gas um, based on a national price. And maybe as, as we're sort of um, spreading um, energy production right across the country, especially in the Northwest with all its nuclear and renewables in the RFC, basically, if you're close to those um, uh, energy production centres, then you get lower bills and that might be able to um, encourage businesses to move maybe out of southeast and London, where traditionally it's, it makes more sense to invest, because um, that's where all the economic growth has been historically and, and start moving out to the northwest, uh, the west midlands, east midlands, northeast and southwest in my case. Um, and then finally, um, just because we, we've had um, off gem here, um, I do, uh, well, would like to see um, maybe the government take a brave step in, in looking at its remit again to really allow that anticipatory investment to upgrade our infrastructure um, and all the all the jobs and, and investment that that would bring, particularly for our, our charging network and also to help bring um, renewables projects um, online in a, in a more cost efficient way in the long term, because I think that will drive down um, bills in the long term for consumers as well. Um, I don't know if other people saw, though, that there was a, um, a story the other day 
about um, a company which had um, pocketed, I think it was like 30 million or something, but like, don't, don't take my word, it might be the wrong figure, but millions of pounds that was um, originally meant for investment in, in heat pump um, infrastructure upgrades and stuff. But um, yeah, they, they somehow managed to keep hold of that. So I think the, the government and the industry needs to make sure that um, any unused capital goes back to bill payers in the first place. Um, and then one, one final thing, I think it was Emma on the, on the last panel made the brilliant point that businesses want to see net zero happen. There's definitely no rollback. I, I would encourage basically all the, all the brilliant speakers and organizations that have been on this um, call to make sure you're screaming that as, as loud as possible to, to your MPs and, your, and, and the government. Because um, I, I, I definitely come across it. We work with industry a lot um, in the renewables or hydrogen sector or nuclear sector, for example, and they're all saying it like net zero is basically uh, the, the future prosperity of the United Kingdom and it needs to make sure that um, politicians definitely uh, know that. Um, so I'll, I'll end there because uh, just so we can get on to Q&A because uh, yeah that's where it's upon there but thank you very much again. Thank you so much Jack it's really useful to have that perspective. I think what's been really interesting in the chat is how much there has been a focus on a couple of things which are really still considered both challenges and opportunities and I think what um, key here is anxiety about um, uh, uh, for the consumer about where to go to get reliable provision if you want to do stuff well. Um, the provision, the the amount of skills and the jobs that are, are required, whether the whether the skills are being uh, are being provided and whether people are being uh, skilled up to do this. The number of jobs I think is what is interesting. One person pointed out in the chat. If, we, if there's all those jobs and we've got the people to to do them, um, which we really also need to um, think uh, quite carefully about. So we've got supply chain issues. We've got confidence in the market. We've got costs that continue to be the case. And we need to be able to identify how, man, how, how those costs can be reduced, um, uh, as well as the issue to do with um, uh, with uh, jobs and so forth. So, I mean, I would I would go back to to Joe, who Joe Lappin from uh, the uh, Cumbria Lep. Joe, you there's been a lot of conversation in the chat about uh, skills. You've you've mentioned a bit about the, the boot camps. Can you tell us a little bit about that and where you think there might need to be more? Because as um, Philip pointed out, the government, uh, from his perspective, the government might be doing something, but they're not really quite seized on the scale of what's required. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, th thank you, Polly. I think for me, we've just got to be realistic because at times we're absolutely super inflating the level of jobs. And the reality is that many of the jobs that we're talking about is retooling, repurposing things that are already being done in the economy. So I think we need to get really, really clear about what these new jobs are. In terms of boot camps, government is uh, hopefully going to be working with LEPs as we speak to identify what's needed in their geography. And these are very short, sharp, 16 week courses, lots of guided learning hours that will allow people to very quickly obtain a qualification. These are ordinarily at level three, um, but for green jobs, they can be at level two. And we already know certainly in our economy, there is absolute interest. We've done some soft market testing for people to be doing things around retrofitting and electric charging installation. So I think we would really like to be very clear about what's the demand, how do we make sure we're meeting that demand, and then we can actually go out and petition that through the procurement process. She says hopefully, assuming that DFE do confirm this with LEPs very soon. Thank you. That's really helpful. I, um, I, it would be worthwhile to, um, actually taking that from, uh, the, uh, from uh, the perspective of um, uh, of uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce. Miranda, would you have views? I mean, from your perspective, the, your own members must be thinking, not only do we, do we know what to do, but also do we know who to hire? No, that's exactly right. Um, I mean, first of all, it, it's really good that we've seen a, a stepping up in, in interest from businesses. Um, COP26, although people challenge what it might have achieved long term and globally. Certainly in the UK, we, we've seen a real step change in terms of business interest. And also 
especially from the large businesses, suddenly looking down at their, their impacts and realising with their scope three impacts, they, they actually have to start to go out into their supply chains. So you've got a lot of SMEs going, OK, what do we do? How do we do it? Um, and there's, there's a lot of support for the development of courses to upskill not only um, low carbon experts to go into all sorts of businesses, but those who are going to be developing new low carbon technologies, but especially those installers. Um, if we're looking at the new technologies, um, whether it's a heat pump or, or um, solar or PV, all of those things need um, the installers. So those are, those are an awful lot of the jobs that need to be created as well. So there is, there is a real step change that needs to be made in terms of, of the training and uh, facilitation of enough of those job roles out there. It, it's a huge opportunity. But as has been mentioned in the chat, where are the people? Have we got enough? And we need to get those training courses running and, and taking those people through to those opportunities. Adam, I'm going to bring you in um, because I was I was interested to just get your perspective on this jobs and skills uh, uh, element, because if we're actually going to tackle fuel poverty and get to net zero, obviously we know that that's going to require a lot of people to do a lot of things. Joe's point taken that, you know, it might actually be people who've already got jobs, but they need to do them perhaps differently. What is your perspective on what this can do about retaining um, economic value within communities, what it's what um, help it can do with levelling up, as well as the issues to do with uh, fuel poverty for the, for the consumer? I think one of the challenges we've had is by uh, regarding this as a, as a policy outcome that's a win-win-win-win-win-win-win. A Everything's kind of shovel ready. You just press the button and it goes. Now, clearly, we've seen that if you design the program incorrectly for, to do short-term economic stimulus and you have over-ambitious uh, targets about what that means for, for, for job development, you, you don't get outcomes in, in any of those things. From our, our perspective, it's in order to grow the market, You've got to make market in certain areas. Why we're so keen that the government money is made available to the worst first, households in the worst conditions, people on the lowest incomes, and work with local authorities and local actors, is can want it gets you over the rump of those people who are not going to be able to transact and optimize their own assets through any other financial incentive. But it gives you that controlled element because a lot of the challenges is around the quality of advice the quality of outcomes and the quality of uh, installation. It, it gives you that element of control that you build these markets in ways in which you are able to control quality. You can engage directly with communities about the value of what's happening and what you, where you can expect to see the, the outcomes. And, and you can do it in a way that builds supply chains, builds proper training, builds proper customer service as well, which is going to be absolutely critical in a, in a, in a general uh, kind of sense, not only for low income kind of households. But I, I think that we have to be honest, there was quite a, a bitter lesson around green home grants and, and vouchers, which is we've been saying it's shovel ready, just press the button and it will happen. And it ain't true, is it? Because that market has degraded and the jobs have degraded. So you have to make this market and the most effective um, way of making it without enabling a consumer service meltdown market failure is to do it with the greatest level of controls that you can, while also banking the benefits, both in terms of fuel poverty and carbon abatement and market making by focusing on those people who will not step forward or unable, just don't have the money to be able to pay in uh, for their own, own property. So I think there's huge amounts of benefits, but I think, to be honest, those of us who have been advocating for speed and acceleration, just do it now and throw money at it. Quite a salutary lesson. You've got to make sure that those preconditions are in place in order that you get a market which doesn't emit to market failure, daily mail headlines, scams, kind of poor levels of service straight away, because that's that's in no one's interests. Can I just therefore bring in, just to, to make sure that we, that we sort of finish before we, we um, go to uh, Paul on the, sort of the political context within which we're operating here and therefore I'd like to talk to uh, ask both Jack and Henry I'm going to sort of basically abuse my position as chair and ask you to sort of uh, bring bring the uh, the alternative perspective on what the likelihood is of this current government and the local authorities who have got some kind of of competence and, and capacity on this to shape those markets what is the appetite 
Jack and the Henry do you see in national government to do the kind of things that Adam's talking about and whether there are alternative ways that are more likely to happen because of the priorities of this government and uh, local authorities, particularly those Metro mayors. Can I start with Jack and then go to Henry, if that's all right? Um, yeah, first I'd, I'd say I, I completely agree that like, um, you can't just say like, it's there, press go, like we can have an immediate economic recovery from COVID, which was basically the, the sort of way that it was sold um, with the Green Homes Grant. And obviously that, that didn't go well. Um, and I think maybe the government like has been a bit worried and it sort of got his fingers burnt from, um, from the Green Homes Grant. But I think the situation fundamentally now has changed and I think that might, um, I mean, I'm, I'm totally guessing because obviously I haven't spoken to Rishi personally about this, <laughs> um, but I think that might change it because he, he's just spent nine billion pounds um, bailing out um, bill payers. Uh, as we move to October, if bills go up to 3,000 pounds, that, that constituency of few or four people is only ever going to expand. Like um, he, he's just gonna have to be bailing out um, an, a, an ever larger group of people. So it, it kind of just makes much more economic sense. Of course, it does take time to scale up um, energy efficiency, and um, uh, it, it's not it's not going to happen overnight. But it is still one of the um, the relatively faster things that we can do to well, reduce gas demand while we diversify our supply by clean energy and nuclear, basically, um, as well as finding other gas supplies from um, more savoury states. Um, and I'd just like to quickly add on the on the skills point because um, I think that is absolutely vital. Um, I think Onwards did a really good report and they found that, uh, uh, that there's more um, courses for golf course maintenance than there are for heat pump installers or, or, or some crazy stat like that. Um, there's quite a few MPs who have been really pushing on the on the green skills side. I know the, the skills um, bill, which has recently just gone through report stage, um, a cross bench peer, I think it was Baron Heyman managed to um, managed to get an amendment on which said. Uh, Basically, when you're doing your local skills plans, you have to take net zero and nature into account. I think that was a really important step forward and it's definitely puts the, the green skills agenda on the government's radar. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pass on that. The other Great, percent. Henry, just briefly, because we need to go to Paul quickly, but I just wanted to do your perspective from the, of the local government angle. I think the, the potential is huge, isn't it, Polly, to, to do this, but it can't be done from the centre and the Green Homes Grant that Jack mentioned was a public policy disaster but that's because it was designed and delivered by Whitehall um if you would if you designed Whitehall a program, are useless at that sort of thing that's yeah no, exactly and, and I think and I, and I without being rude I mean I, I just think that Treasury just didn't understand the reality of what they were doing I mean there's lots of well-developed plans I'm sitting in Greater Manchester today I'm sitting Andy after this in fact with a group of people talk about the plan in GM to deliver net zero in particular to accelerate retrofit the only missing link is where is the funding mechanism to back up the, the government's plan to decarbonise heat. Show us that plan and we can get on with it. But in reality, the, the money to back up the rhetoric just isn't there. And if, if we look at the gas crisis we're now facing, we might need to be installing heat pumps and insulating homes a lot faster than we first expected. There is absolutely no way the central government's going to be able to lead that. They're going to have to trust places, particularly command authorities, local authorities, working in partnership. And let's remember that the only useful bit, the only effective bit of the Green Homes Grant was the stuff that was given to local authorities. And I'll just remind, like I have in the chat, there was a Conservative manifesto pledge to spend nine billion quid on energy retrofit. Jack, if you can have any words with anybody about making sure they spend that money, we could head off the energy crisis and kickstart the economy after the pandemic. Uh, just saying. Right, I'm going to pass over before I abuse my position as chair any further to Paul Bircham, the Regulation and Communications Director at Electricity Northwest for our closing address. Thanks very much, Polly. Uh, and I think the first thing for me to say is to thank you for uh, excel expertly and excellently chairing the discussion today. You've brought everybody in at the right time. Um, the discipline has, has been fantastic and I, I've never known uh, you'll be able to control my boss and Jonathan Brearley so tightly. So that's great. Um, a few lessons for me to learn there. Um, but the way you've you've brought so many um, of the different speakers in uh, and and brought the debate out from the chat as well, that's, it's been great. So thank you very much and for your own insights as well. And then I'd like to just thank all of our speakers today. We've had a, a really rich panel with um, many very interesting, very insightful uh, contributions and a real um, diversity of views in some respects, but some very strong common themes coming out. So I really want to thank all of our speakers. A um, couple of things that 
it occurs to me in listening through this event um, that are common across some of this, the presentations we've had, that there is a huge amount of optimism and positivity and willingness to take on the challenges that are presented to us and people looking forward to solutions, not just uh, wallowing in concern about the, the problems, whether that is problems about um, pricing or problems about moving forward on net zero, a, a really great sense that there is a willingness to respond to the challenge. And that challenge was fantastically well articulated for us by, by Lord Deepen as well. Um, what, a, what an excellent speaker he really is and, and quite inspirational. Um, for us at Electricity Northwest, um, I think these, these kind of contributions are fantastic and help us continually think about our role and what we can do um, and how we can support the great ambition that this region continues to demonstrate. Um, there is a continued appetite for economic growth and development across the region and uh, good energy infrastructure is vital to support that and we stand ready to, to provide that. Whether that is providing the, the support for um, the ambitions that Cumbria might have with, with new nuclear generation or supporting the rollout of heat pumps and electric vehicles as we seek to decarbonize. So there's, there's lots that we can do in that, that space uh, and there's lots that we're already doing. But what's also very clear from all the discussion today is the enormous drive across the Northwest to ensure that we do this in a fair and just manner and that the transition to a net zero economy uh, doesn't leave anybody behind. So that requires us to focus on capacity building with all parts of our communities, uh, helping people understand how they can benefit. And that is also something we've heard loud and clear in developing our business plan. So that's why our business plan includes support for um, a lot of our partner organizations to ensure that we can reach out and provide advice on energy efficiency and improving uh, the lives of the quarter of a million uh, people in the Northwest who are actually living in fuel poverty. Uh, and our plan does include the capability to do that. And that is something that our customers told us they were really keen to see was, was included in that plan and they're really willing to pay for. So uh, we have a plan that can help uh, very positively our communities in our region. We have a plan that can help build the economy of our region. Uh, and we have a plan which enables us to increase investment a uh, 33% increase in investment whilst reducing bills uh, and uh, directly tackling uh, the, the issues of energy prices for uh, our, all of our customers and all of our businesses and particularly helping those in the most vulnerable circumstances. So I think, I think there's a lot to, to be positive about that comes from the discussion that we've heard today and at Electricity Northwest, we're really keen to continue to support all of that positivity and optimism and to help the region move forward and tackle these fantastic challenges. Uh, so I just wanted to close by thanking everybody very much for that. Um, asking you all to take up Jonathan on his offer of participating in the uh, open hearings that Ofgem are running uh, on for Electricity Northwest, that open hearing will be on the 23rd of March. And I'll ask someone to put another link to where you can sign up to be part of that debate in the chat again now, because it's really important that the voices that we've heard from everybody on the panel today and through the chat, everybody who's participated, continue to be heard within Ofgem to make sure that as we move forward, we do get a, a place-based settlement in terms of ensuring that the business plan that we're going to deliver for the electrical infrastructure of the Northwest meets the needs of all of the communities in the Northwest and all of the businesses and customers who live and work in the Northwest. So uh, thank you for your engagement today. 
thank everybody for participating and I look forward to seeing you continue to participate as we move forward and uh, tackle these challenges together. Thank you so much, Paul. I, it only uh, leaves me to thank everybody again for all of your contributions, to remind you about the open hearings, as I, uh, the Ofgem is holding, that everyone really should get involved in if they can. We're supporting our members very specifically to contribute to those because we think the conversation needs to be opened up more and be made deeper and more and, and uh, more rich between local authorities and the uh, and energy and the energy industry and the energy sector because local authorities understand their places best and for those place-based settlements to be designed with them not just in mind but actually at the table shaping them. We've done some uh, work which I will share in the chat now which um, uh, helps inform that but if you have a local authority that you know particularly those who are in our network and you can check out our membership on our website we'd be really keen to make sure that we can support them to be part of those. I think my what has struck me about this is that we are all really clear that there are some extraordinary external pressures on the energy sector right now and that there are also things that feel like they're inevitable or immovable like costs which actually aren't if we use our collective power to ask and call for change as well as shaping that change ourselves to our own ability as businesses and entrepreneurs using the powers that we have if we if we have powers either delegated to us by a national government or um, established in statute as local government. Those things can mean we can change the rules to make sure that the, the, econ the economy that we work in meets the challenges of climate change. Because without that, if we have rules that are, are, are fit for a previous era, where dependency on fossil fuel was, um, was a given and was seen as basically the thing that drove our economic growth, we will not only find ourselves paying more in the future, but and not just in eco economic terms, in lives and livelihoods. And I think that's the thing that, although I didn't want to end on a grim note, Lord Deben was very powerful about that. It is, the, it is the ability of human beings to see clearly what is ahead of them and adapt and adopt what is, uh, what is required in order to be able to make sure that we have full and flourishing lives not just in the future, but now. And when things are really scary, that's a really important thing to hold on to. So I'd like to thank Electricity Northwest for, for hosting this and bringing everybody together. I hope everybody has found it useful. I know Jill is gonna um, capture the chat and make sure that the questions that were asked, if they weren't posed now and they're factual ones that people can get back to. And I hope this conversation will continue into the future. Thank you very much, everybody. And hope you have a good day and a great weekend. Yeah, thank you, Polly.